The Bremen port in Germany was one of the main ports of mass emigration to America. More than a million people left from this port between 1845 and 1860, looking to escape the political and economic turmoil of Germany. Some of these emigrants would even make the journey on foot, entering the centuries-old town square and marveling at the magnificent and historic Bremen City Hall, originally constructed in the 1400s. New era ticket holders ranged from modest to well-to-do. Some had sold everything, homes, farms, all possessions, and were carrying their entire wealth in pockets and suitcases. From sentimental trinkets to rough-cut diamonds to gold coins, the new era carried a fascinating cargo, and many personal family stories with it that would have been passed down to future descendants. Regardless of their economic status, all had one thing in common. They were hoping to build a better life in America. Steerage held the bulk of the passengers, who were crammed into the dark, windowless hold, unable to even sit up in their berths in the close quarters. American and English ships were not the traditional ships to bring passengers from Germany to America. Germans felt they provided inadequate transportation in comparison to German ships. Typically, when passengers signed a contract to sail on a vessel, it stated that should their ship become unavailable, it would be replaced with another good ship. Germans were encouraged to specify in their contracts that it be replaced, more specifically, with another good German ship. The New Era was a beautiful new clipper, designed for speed and intended to get high-value cargo to its destination as expediently as possible. It was less geared for passenger transport, despite the 384 men, women, and children on board. Records vary, but including kitchen and crew members, she was reported to carry 425 souls. Bremen was one of the earliest ports to enforce safety regulations, including basic guidelines for provisions, space requirements, and a mandatory doctor on board. The New Era embarked on September 28, 1854, headed for New York. Ocean travel was risky business. Aside from the obvious dangers, more sinister things lurked in the shadows. Prior to departure, one of the would-be passengers on the ship succumbed to the very contagious cholera, a bacterial intestinal infection that can kill within hours if left untreated. A crowded, unsanitary ship was the perfect breeding ground for disease to spread, owing to tight quarters and low ventilation. Approximately 40 more would die of cholera upon the voyage and were unceremoniously tossed overboard to avoid panic among the passengers. The ship was plagued with bad weather along the way, gale after gale. On October 20th, a storm surged and a huge wave crashed the decks, washing out the stove in the kitchen galley and sweeping two or three passengers overboard, where their last moments consisted of the nightmare of facing certain death alone in the freezing Atlantic. The loss of the stove resulted in the passengers receiving only one hot meal every two days. The incident also caused the ship to leak, necessitating the crew to recruit passengers to help man the pumps, which now had to run constantly to keep the ship afloat. There were reports from survivors that the crew sat back, some even laughing, while the passengers did all the work. Just over three weeks passed again and again, the New Era ran into severe weather as she approached America's shoreline. At about 4 a.m. on November 13, 1854, in dense fog, stormy seas, and high winds, a procedure called sounding showed they were approaching more shallow water. In this procedure, a weighted line is dropped to test the depth. The water depth goes from 17 fathoms to 15 to 11. Seaman Charles Griffin reports that the captain is notified, who tells them that they must be near the Jersey Shore and to keep a close lookout. Two men were placed on watch, but unfortunately the fog had been so thick that it was hard to see much beyond the ship itself. A call suddenly broke out into the night. Breakers ahead! We will be ashore in a moment! Some report that a confused and panicked call of fire rang out. And before further orders could be made, the ship violently struck an outer bar of what was known as Deal Beach, now part of Asbury Park, two to three hundred yards from the shore. Passenger Johanna Heidenreich gives her account of the chaos that ensued. While the passengers in the bunks around me were still fast asleep, we were suddenly awakened by a violent shock and felt the ship hit the ground. 
We dressed quickly, but remained quietly downstairs while some of the men went up to see what was there. When they returned, they tried to calm our fears, but soon, to our horror, the water came in so quickly that some people drowned in their bunks before they could even get any courage. Now we rushed onto the deck, where we tried to shelter ourselves as best we could in the cabin or in the forecastle. I went for the ladder. The men mostly climbed into the masts and yards, others into the bowsprit. During the ordeal, the crew began ringing the bell to alert anyone on shore and firing signal guns for help. Abner Allen, eventual namesake of the town of Allenhurst and the keeper of the nearby volunteer life-saving station, responded immediately. Allen's station was equipped with a mortar to fire a line to the ship and a small surf boat designed to cut through the waves to reach vessels in distress. Conditions made it too dangerous to launch the surf boat. It would have been impossible to reach the ship. The crew attempts to relaunch the new era, but the strong winds spin her aground further, and she cannot be saved. When the vessel struck aground, Louisa Heyer's first instinct was to grab the $200 from her trunk. She was facing two possible life-or-death situations simultaneously, one from the immediate danger of the ocean, and the other from a scenario in which, had she lost all of her money, she would have no way to support herself in this new land where she knew no one until she was able to reach her brother in Wisconsin. She tied her money purse to her skirt, stepped out into the storm on deck, and was immediately swept overboard by a huge wave. In the process, she managed to grab hold of a rope as she headed over the side and clung tightly to it, landing mercifully next to a broken pole from the ship, which she also grabbed hold of. She was violently thrashed back and forth against the ship by the icy waves, which were beating her badly. The first lifeboat is dropped with the intention of getting a rope line to the shore to steady the lifeboats and bring passengers back and forth safely. Gaspar Barbaric describes the scene. The passengers made a rush for the first boat when it was lowered, but the sailors stood before it with drawn knives and threatened to kill anyone who attempted to get into it. Herman Vogler, a passenger, concurs. I happened to be during that night on the pumps as our ship leaked badly and the passengers were obliged to work on them to keep the ship afloat. I had just returned from the deck when the ship ran ashore. The crash was an awful one and the screams and the fright of the passengers were heart-rendering. At the same time, the ship filled with water very rapidly and I managed to get on deck and into the first cabin. I had hardly entered the same as a thundering wave rolled over the ship and filled the cabin with water. With difficulty, I reached the starboard but hardly had I time to get my breath again, then came another monstrous wave. I took a good hold of the iron in which the ship bell hangs and saved myself from being washed overboard. By this time, a few sailors were lowering a boat, and I hastened to the side of the ship to get in with them, but one of the sailors held his knife toward me in such a position that I could not but understand his meaning. I did not have time to take the matter into consideration and climbed as fast as I could in the mast. The crew was later accused by the passengers of abandoning them in favor of saving themselves. However, they would not have been able to reach the shore with the line if it was overrun with passengers, and all would be lost. The boats required men who could steer them to shore in a violent sea, and there were but six truly experienced sailors in the entire crew. The waves were crashing more than ten feet high, and the lifeboats were not necessarily a safer place to be. The line was broken along the way, and the captain later claims it was deliberately picked up and thrown overboard. There was contention between the captain and crew, both seeking to place blame for the wreck and the aftermath, and the conflicting accounts of events reflect this. Crew member Gustav Bain claims the line was too short and needed to be cut to free the boat. The first lifeboat reaches the shore, but cannot return with another line. First mate George Jordan and six crewmen are saved. The beach is quickly filled with men waiting to assist. Young wreckmaster Edward Wardell soon arrived on scene. Working for the Board of Underwriters, it was his job as wreckmaster to organize a crew for the purpose of rescue and salvage. He looked on and mobilized his men for the moment it became possible to reach the vessel. They brought with them the standard life-saving equipment, including surf boats and a life car. The life car had been designed in 1845 by Joseph Francis for just such an occasion. When the ocean was too violent for a rowboat, the life car would encapsulate the passengers, who could only fit in three or four at a time, and safely bring them to shore via the line. 
Aside from being very heavy and difficult to maneuver, it was a terrifying experience to enter the dark box, not unlike a coffin, in raging water. The line was shot out several times, but kept firing astray. Unfortunately, there were deficits in the life-saving equipment as well. It had been replenished the year before, but the sea air rusted and weakened the wires that held the rope to the mortar balls. This proved to be a problem as the day went on. The second lifeboat is launched. William von Rensselaer, a cabin passenger with apparent sailing experience, saw the second boat drop amidst the chaos and was stunned to notice that as it was about to be lowered, there was no rope in it and the plug hole was open. Most of the passengers were on deck now, being pounded by waves and swept out to sea. He jumped into the boat, fastened a rope, plugged the hole, and took a plumb line with him so that a sturdier rope could be later attached when they reached the shore. Three crewmen jumped in and they set off with an oar, he being the only one among them who knew how to steer. They were met with the high sea about halfway in, and the plumb line ran out and became taut, snapping his oar from him. They thought they would be dumped into the waves and surely drown, but one of the crew cut the line so they could free themselves. Crewmate Gustav Bain reported that about 50 of the passengers were standing upon the line to lift themselves above the waves, and it had to be cut. Von Rensselaer and the rest of the sailors made it to shore, where they tried to bring a line back to the ship. The surf was rolling in powerfully, and the wreckers made a futile attempt to launch them back out. At one point, Von Rensselaer states that they were almost able to launch the boat, but several of the seamen had jumped out to save passengers. Defeated, their strength gave out and they were brought to rest at the home of whom they referred to as a farmer, where they were given food and beds at what was most likely Abner Allen's boarding house. The third and final boat, a longboat, is released into the water but needs to be bailed out. The captain reports that as the crew was engaged in bailing the water, the passengers were frantic with fear and attempted to rush the boat. The crew pushed off during which time he accuses them of cutting the line once again leaving them disconnected from the shore. The doctor was crushed between the ship and the boat as he attempted to board it, and only one passenger managed to get in. The sea was breaking over us, the passengers were drenched with water and freezing with cold. No communication had been established with the land. Most of my crew had deserted, and my last boat was gone. Our only hope was in the strength of our ship, in a fortunate lull of the sea, or in assistance from the inhabitants of the coast, who were gathered upon the shore. We returned to Johanna, clinging to the ladder with her mother. For two to three hours, although we were soaked to the skin, we held on against the onslaught of the angry waves. The railing and part of the front fort were torn away during this time. At nine o'clock, the ladder, in which I and about twenty others had taken refuge, began to fall apart, and I had to go out with my poor mother. The waves continuously passed over us, and despite all my efforts, my mother was thrown to the ground two or three times while we were trying to reach the rigging. Finally, she lay exhausted on the ground, and before I could help her, a powerful wave swept her overboard. I never saw her again. Towering waves have forced nearly 200 people to climb the starboard riggings. The ship sinks further into the sand as it continues to fill with water. Abner Allen confirmed that although the three boats from the New Era reached the shore, the high surf prevented them from launching back out to sea with a line. By this time, Luisa's rope could no longer bear the strain of the constant battering, and it snapped, cutting her loose into the wild ocean. I shrieked loudly for assistance until I became almost unconscious with terror. I felt the huge waves breaking over me but from the natural instinct of self-preservation, I clung yet more tightly to the spar. It seemed that my hold was gradually relaxing, and I must inevitably perish. But how good was providence to me in the midst of that frightful calamity? The consequence of what seemed to me certain destruction constituted my safety, for the flood tide carried me to the shore, where I was rescued by a generous seaman at the risk of his own life. Life-saving crew on shore attempts to fire another line onto the ship. This might not seem so daunting, but the process of rigging the life-saving lines was a complicated one, requiring basic knowledge of what to do with the line once it reached the ship. 
Here is a brief demonstration, courtesy of the Chickamauga Comico Historical Association in Rodanthe, North Carolina. Allen states that the first shot they fired missed due to the strong winds. The second did not have sufficient powder to project it far enough. On the third shot, the wire connecting the ball to the rope broke. The crowd on shore watched in horror as a high wind caught a boom and swung it over the deck, knocking dozens of passengers into the waves. Finally, the ball threw the line over the bowsprit, establishing a connection. Rather than use the life car, which Allen expected them to do, the wreckers attached a lifeboat to the line, which was easier to rig and therefore the faster option. There was not a moment to lose. The ship hauled it in. Captain Henry explains how he came to end up in the lifeboat, which was cause for great consternation after the fact. Before this boat reached the ship's side, it was filled with water, and as soon as it was within reach, I stepped into it to bail, that the work of the passengers to the shore might be commenced without delay. While I was engaged in this, a rush was made for the boat by the passengers and fearing that she would instantly be overcrowded and perhaps our rope broken, and all of our present advantages of line communication with the beach destroyed, I motioned to those on the shore to haul in the boat. This was done immediately, about ten passengers being in the boat, myself included. The scene was surely a frenzied disaster. An account from seaman Charles Griffin, however, conflicts with the captain's. The captain ordered some of the crew to get in and bail her out. As soon as they got in, he jumped overboard and scrambled into the boat, leaving five of the crew and his passengers on board. As soon as he got into the boat, he cried out to the people on the beach to haul him on shore. When the passengers saw the captain leaving the ship, ten or twelve of them jumped overboard, and four of them got into the boat. The remainder drowned. Reports were made that the passengers attempting to get into the lifeboat were beaten back by the crew. The boat capsizes several times on the way in, and five people, including Captain Henry, make it to shore alive by clinging to the boat, which came in upside down. The rest drown. The line connection was also broken in this attempt. On board the ship, Johanna continues her ordeal. With terrible effort, I got to the place where the coal was usually stored, and there I found my brother with his wife and children. A wave that knocked me down had torn off all my clothes except for my shirt. I sat with my brother for hours as the water passed over us. We thought every moment was the last of our lives. About two hours after noon, my brother's child was swept away. And soon afterward, two men near us were more beaten than drowned by the waves. On several occasions, in the gaps between each falling wave, I saw men jumping down from the rigging with the desperate cry, my wife, my child. We often saw whole heaps of corpses thrown up by the waves around the ship as the drowning people had clung tightly to each other in their last need and thus met their death. We ourselves could not move from the spot for fear of being swept away at the moment. So. We couldn't see any of the efforts being made on the beach to save us. Another line reaches the ship from shore and is caught in the riggings, out of reach. The cannonball shot is disconnected from the wire and drops into the sea. Lifesavers lack the resources to attempt any more shots, and those on shore had already brought the gunpowder they had from their personal stores. A call was put out for more. Waves would inevitably crash over the broadside ship, sinking deeper into the sand, sweeping away some of the unfortunate passengers who were quickly dragged into the undertow by a strong current that rushed past the ship. A very few made it to shore by grabbing hold of any piece of the wreckage for buoyancy, such as wood planks and pieces of the bulwarks, 
where they were saved by the surfmen who were able to reach them amidst the many corpses floating in alongside. Meanwhile, a telegraph dispatch had gone out that morning to Sandy Hook, alerting two steamers stationed nearby, the Achilles and Leviathan. The first of four ships, the Achilles arrives on the scene, followed by the Leviathan, the Excelsior, and the Hector. Eyewitness Elias Smith arrives aboard the Achilles. He said the decision was made to leave immediately rather than head over to the city for wrecking schooners because the report was that the new era was breaking up quickly, with many on board. They had departed at 9.30 that morning to do what they could, but the rough waters and low visibility made it impossible to reach the site of the wreck expediently. None, however, are able to safely approach the new era, nor were they equipped to render much assistance. Smith describes the scene upon the fog lifting, with corpses floating by amidst pieces of the wreckage. He sees hundreds packed tightly in the rigging to avoid being washed overboard, and parents holding their children tightly, screaming for help to the equally helpless upon the shore. He poignantly notes the body of a four- or five-year-old child drift past, followed by several others, with and without clothing. Herman Vogler was there on the ropes and tells of his experience after being chased from the first lifeboat that morning. Here I found myself safe from the lashing of the waves, but nevertheless the suffering was awful. Having partly undressed when retiring from the pumps, I had no coat nor vest and had to stand barefooted on the thin rope, which cut badly into my feet. Back aboard the Achilles, Smith laments, We found we could do nothing. This steamer, which is employed expressly by the underwriters to render assistance to vessels ashore, has not the sign of a surf boat on board, nothing but two miserable yawls, both of which would scarcely float the vessel's crew where she's sinking, and not one of them could float herself if put overboard. Not a spar, line, or life preserver. Not a piece of cork big enough to float a drowning dog. He sees the boats on the shore, notes the absence of a lifeline as of yet, but acknowledges that the weather was preventing them. No communication could be made as the emigrants could not understand English, and none of the Americans could speak German or Dutch. The ship remained broadside with mountainous waves, making it impossible for the tugs to render assistance. A 7 p.m. dispatch notes that the ship is a perfect wreck, and there is not the least hope of saving anything. The decision was made to send the Achilles and Leviathan back, while the Hector, better equipped but smaller and slower, waited for the weather to ease up. Night falls, magnifying the effects of the frigid November winds and waves. In the darkness, no further rescue attempts could be made from the shore. Those upon the shore lit bonfires to let the passengers know they had not abandoned them, and gathered around the warmth in the freezing wind. Many noted later that the sounds of the screams and pleas for help were devastating to those who were helpless to do anything. Through it all, the ship's bell continuously rang out its urgent cry. The deck is now level with the sea, and Griffin notes that Many of the immigrants, benumbed and frozen, lost their hold, and dropped from the shrouds into the sea, and were drowned. Johanna spends the night crying and praying. William von Rensselaer, the cabin passenger who came in on the second lifeboat, returns to the scene in the freezing night to see what he could do to help. Though the waves were still dangerously high, the weather has abated enough for Edward Wardell to begin launching his surfboats with his crewmen. He is the first man from shore to step aboard the wreck. Still dark, many of the passengers are too weak and too terrified to enter the boats in the high seas. At first light, the passengers begin to board the three boats, and the rescue operation is in full swing. Von Rensselaer helped people board the lifeboats, rocking dangerously to and from the ship. He noted the indescribable horrors that met his eyes. Corpses piled on deck, some appearing to be sleeping, others battered and mangled. He makes five or six trips back and forth with survivors and is instrumental in the rescue effort. A painful aside about von Rensselaer is that his wife passed away on this voyage a month earlier, perhaps one of the cholera victims. After two and a half hours, all 135 survivors were safely on shore, sheltered and fed in Allen's home and barn, both so crowded that some could only rest in the sun on the sand. Only twelve of the survivors were women, strong enough to hang on through the night. Two hundred and fifty-three people died in the wreck of the New Era. An eyewitness to the wreck describes the scene of the ship hours after the rescue. 
telling of the bodies of men, women, and children tied to the rigging, hanging lifeless from arms and legs, hands and feet, or tossed together in heaps on deck, limbs protruding from the broken sides of the ship, faces frozen in the most painful expressions. He tells of young women, old men, and babies that are but weeks old. The victims represented every age and station of life, all within reach of America's shores. In 1933, a man wrote to James Woods, vice president of the Monmouth County Historical Association. This man said that Edward Wardell, wreckmaster, representative of the Board of Underwriters for the New Era and rescuer of survivors, recounted the tale to him many years later, still unable to keep tears from filling his eyes. The wreck occurred in line with 7th Avenue in Asbury Park, at approximately the distance you see here, between two and 300 yards out. This was the vantage point of those on board, minus all buildings, with nothing but a vast and wild shoreline. It is surprising to see how seemingly close they were, close enough to be heard from shore, but too far away to be saved. So we hope you enjoyed that, and now we're going to take a look at the legacies and mysteries surrounding the new era. A large majority of the bodies that washed up along the shore in the days following the wreck could not be identified, and were buried in a mass grave in the cemetery of the old First United Methodist Church in West Long Branch. The number of bodies buried here is unknown, though some estimates report upwards of 185. For years, this spot was marked by a simple wooden cross, and initial efforts to erect a lasting monument to the dead fell flat due to sectarian prejudice, as many of the immigrants happened to be German Jews. In 1892, members of the newly formed New Era Monument and Benevolent Association arranged for a granite monument to be erected at the site, marking the final resting place of those who perished in the tragic wreck of the New Era. This monument still stands today, largely hidden from view in a peaceful location at the back of the cemetery. Though artifacts from the new era are exceedingly rare, MCHA is fortunate to have several in its collection. The two items seen here were both donated in 1938 by Mrs. Anne Herbert. On the left is a simple wooden soap dish. While the connection between Mrs. Herbert and the wreck remains unknown, the donation record notes that the soap dish was among the debris that washed ashore at the time of the wreck. On the right is a simple hair comb. The description of this artifact has a slightly more morbid tone, noting as a German silver comb taken from the hair of one of the victims of the new era. This glass stein was given to MCHA in 1939 by Mrs. George Corley's Allen of Asbury Park, with the record indicating that it washed ashore from the wreck. The evidence linking this object to the wreck leaves little doubt as to its authenticity. Engraved in the pewter lid is J. Meitinger. A list of known survivors published in the papers shortly after the wreck confirms that among these survivors was a man named John Meitinger. In addition, the donor of this item, Mrs. Allen, was the daughter-in-law of Allen Abner, captain of the Lock Arbor Life Saving Station and first on scene at the wreck. The sketch for this painting was done by Drummond White, born in 1811 and a lifelong resident of Ocean Township. A large number of spectators who gathered on the beach while the disaster played out were able to observe events firsthand. Presumably, White was among them. The copy artist has mistakenly dated this tragic event as happening on November 11, 1854, when the wreck actually took place on November 13. Certainly the largest relics of the new era would be the anchors. The anchor on the left here was supposedly on display as a temporary memorial near the spot of the wreck, though we're not sure what happened to it over the years. Maybe it was removed in favor of the later boardwalk monument, nobody really knows. In 1999, local historian Dr. Richard Fernicola discovered the larger anchor on the right, just off the jetty in Asbury Park, near to the wreck site. He believes the anchor is from the new era, and it is now on display in Allenhurst at the corner of Norwood and Elberon. This newspaper notation from 1854 states that the chains, anchors, and rigging were sold on December 5th. Many wrecks were scrapped if possible and sold for parts to help cut losses. 
So at first we got curious and thought, wait a second, if the anchors were sold, how were they found in the ocean years later? And the answer may be that a clipper of this type had anywhere from four to five anchors, two main anchors and two to three smaller ones, according to the main Maritime Museum. So perhaps not all of the anchors were able to be brought up at the time. There's no marking on the anchors that tell us what ship they belong to, so it has to be an educated guess according to the site in which it was found. A plaque in front of the Anchor Memorial is dedicated to those who lost their lives, as well as those who risked their lives, and in recognition of the U.S. Life Saving Service, which developed into the U.S. Coast Guard in part due to this wreck. And finally, one last thing, this trunk was donated in 2000 to the Township of Ocean Historical Museum. The family claimed to have handed down the chest through generations for more than a century. Not sure how it came to them, perhaps through a descendant of a survivor. We haven't had a chance to look into that yet. Um, but obviously, they used it through the years. You can see that it's been painted and decorated with a few stickers. And then they decided to donate it for posterity. So it's pretty cool to see yet another item that may have been on that voyage. There's so few of them left. While no one can say for certain, it is estimated that around 140 people survived the wreck of the new era. Various sources, most notably German and U.S. papers in the days following the wreck, as well as Julius Sasha's account for the Pennsylvania German Society of 1904, compiled lists of known survivors, though it is likely that no list is complete nor without error, thanks to faulty translations and spellings, slow-traveling news of the day, and the general chaos surrounding the event. These are a few of the known survivors. Teresa Ramstek, who died in 1949, was often cited as the last survivor of the wreck of the new era. She died at age 81, making her only 19 years old at the time of the wreck. Teresa was reportedly the mystery woman who visited the mass grave each year on the third Sunday in September, placing flowers at the site and saying a prayer. In relation to this, Teresa stated, I made a vow that so long as God protected my health, I would go each year to the last resting place of those who died in the wreck. Brothers Charles and Theodore Glazer were also among the survivors. Theodore moved to Virginia and at the outbreak of the Civil War joined the Confederate Army, fighting for James Branch's Petersburg Battery, part of the larger Army of Northern Virginia, commanded by General Robert E. Lee. Charles, meanwhile, settled down to farm life in New Jersey, heeding President Abraham Lincoln's call for volunteers when he enlisted with the 1st New Jersey Cavalry, a part of the Army of the Potomac. Knowing that they were fighting on opposite sides of several major battles, the two brothers allegedly made it part of their duty to search for each other in the fields of the dead and wounded. Forty-six years after the New Era wreck, these brothers reunited in New Jersey, no doubt with many tales to tell. In our research library at MCHA, we have two copies of one of the earliest published accounts of the wreck outside of the newspapers, which is Julius Sasha's 1907 The Wreck of the New Era for the Pennsylvania German Society. So we both grab a copy. My copy has a run-of-the-mill newspaper article glued to the flyleaf, nothing exciting. Joe opens his copy to find an original letter from Ada Shaughnessy, daughter of coroner Jordan Woolley, glued into the book. And for a short letter, it's pretty juicy, too. It really shows how contentious the events were surrounding the wreck. The letter was in there for over 120 years, with no record of it. Leave it to Joe to make a fantastic find. My dear Mr. Applegate, I have finished reading your book and was greatly interested, but little disappointed that Father's name was not mentioned, as he was coroner at that time, or some kind of official, and he and Mr. Wardell had charge of the dead. I see in the book Mr. Wardell was the man interviewed by the author and takes all credit for himself. And it was Mr. Wardell's sister who said to me that she had heard my father became rich, robbing the dead of the new era. I told her I knew her brother was father's partner in that affair, and said a few other things which I will not repeat. Now I am wondering how I am going to return your book. I think you will have to come for it some Sunday afternoon, and I can show you my old stuff, or shall I send it by mail? I thank you for papers you send me, and after I read them, I pass them on to an old lady who once lived in Freehold. Yours sincerely, Ada W. Shaughnessy. In a letter from the MCHA archives dated March 14, 1878, Herman Vogler writes to Drummond White, telling of his terrifying experience on board the sinking ship, standing barefoot on a thin rope among the mast in the freezing cold, as well as the fright of the passengers. 
Vogler also describes being threatened at knife point by a crewman as he attempts to board a lifeboat. Here is an excerpt from that letter. In New York, I was kindly received by relations and friends who took good care of me. In February 1855, I arrived at Chicago, got a good situation as clerk, which position I held for eight years. I started then a trunk factory employing 50 hands. Have a nice comfortable home, a good wife, and three splendid boys of 16 years, 8 years, and 4 years. At the Great Fire, October 9, 1871, I lost my store, my factory with all the stock, my residence, but saved my family and some furniture. Had enough left to start business again, rebuilt my house, and am very comfortably situated. If I can possibly get away from home, I shall come with my wife to see you and see the place where I first landed. If you should ever come to Chicago, you must not fail to call on me. I should like very much to have a relic of the new era. Will you be so kind to let me know what relics you have and if it is only a piece of wood from the ship? My best thanks to you for your kind letter and hoping that I may have the pleasure of making your personal acquaintance. I beg to remain very truly yours, Herman Vogler. After surviving two catastrophic events, it is safe to say that Vogler is among the luckiest or unluckiest people, depending on your perspective. In researching Jordan Woolley, the coroner of the New Era disaster, we came across an interesting notation regarding his involvement with the St. James Church in Long Branch. Woolley and a Mr. Edmund West both donated the land for the original St. James Church on Broadway in 1855, one year after the wreck. This record also specified that the church had a bell donated by Jordan Woolley that came from the New Era. Of course, we were very excited to come across this because how cool would it be to hear the very bell that rang out a call for help that day? Ship's bells were usually inscribed with the name of the ship and the date, so if St. James had the bell, it shouldn't be too difficult to identify. Another interesting note about this church is that the wreck master, Edward Wardell, was an original vestryman as well, and very active in the church along with Woolley. So in researching this church, um, we learned a little bit about it. There were two structures. Here's the original structure, and it's the earliest image we could find um, because we know that there were several later additions, and this picture doesn't have those additions in it. So this is the one that was originally on Broadway. Um, on the land donated by Woolley and West, and it's probably 1860s here. Unfortunately, we can't see the bell because the tower is shuttered, but according to that record, it should be in there. Here's the church a little bit later, in between 1900 and 1910. Um, it's got the second edition, and the shutters are now off the bell tower. And then finally, um, an image from about 1910 or so with another little addition there on the right. What's great about this image is how clearly we can see the bell in the tower. So, could this be the only known image of the New Era bell? And is it now in the tower of the new structure? Because we were thinking, why would they get rid of a perfectly good bell, right? It very well could have gone over to the new structure. Here's a photo we found when we looked up the new structure of St. James. It's on Broadway in Slocum. And there's the bell up there, so that's exciting. We called the church to see if we can gain access to inspect it, and Nancy at the office was wonderful. She was very intrigued by the story, um, but told us that there was no longer a bell in the tower, and lo and behold, this is what the tower looks like now. The bell tower is bricked up! What? Are you kidding? You can see where it was three tiers originally, and they removed the middle tier at some point and dropped the cap down. What a heartbreak. And then we thought, well, those bells are around 500 pounds. It would be much easier to just brick it into the tower than bring it down. So is that what happened to it? But on further inspection, we don't think it would have fit depth-wise. But then Nancy told us that there was a large bell, not in use, sitting atop the education wing, and we were welcome to come look at it. They would just have to set up a ladder for us because there was no access hatch to the roof. So she asked if we were comfortable climbing up there. And I thought, well, okay, sure. You know, I'm definitely afraid of heights, but this is totally worth it, right? And how high could it be? Turns out it was very, very high. So you can see Joe over there by the ladder with Mike from the church pantry, who was kind enough to set up the ladder and get us up there. Actually, I decided that I would act as nature photographer and let Joe brave the ladder himself. 
It doesn't look very high in this image, but it really is. And my favorite part was watching Joe going very carefully up this rickety ladder and suddenly throwing his head down to the gentleman holding the ladder, who I couldn't hear but was apparently explaining to Joe that he had a bad shoulder and he wasn't sure he'd be able to hold the ladder if it slipped. So that's Joe saying, what? But in hindsight, this was an incredibly stupid thing to do on both of our parts. But he braved on and he made it to the top and I'm happy to report that Joe remains alive to this day. There he is inspecting the bell and I'm so excited in this moment because if it is from the new era, we really made a huge discovery. And guess what? Nope. This bell was forged in 1874 by Manili and Kimberly of Troy, New York, 20 years too late to have been on the new era. My only consolation in that moment was that I didn't have to climb down the ladder. So where did the bell go? Mike was awesome and took us on a little tour of the church just to make sure there weren't any extra bells laying around. And Joe does what he does best, which is investigate. We went up into the attic and down into the basement. No bells. I have to say, we went back to work feeling pretty defeated, but by the next day we were calling again with questions. Did the church have any records, such as meeting minutes, that might reveal a clue as to where the bell went? And once again, Nancy came through for us and she said she believed there was a safe where the minutes were kept. Within an hour of speaking with her, we were back at the church where Alicia was great and she opened up this incredible safe and gave us access to the records, which had not been accessed in many years. During the course of looking through the materials, we found some clues. Having also spoken with the Long Branch historian, Janice Grace, she had sent over a picture of a document that she had in the Long Branch Public Library collection. There was no date, but it appeared to be an inventory from around the 1950s or 60s or so that specified the presence of four bells in the church. One of them donated by Jordan Woolley. We found a similar inventory amidst the records in the safe, also specifying the presence of four bells in the church. So there are two possibilities here. It's possible the new era bell became confused with the 1874 bell over the years, and it is mistakenly the 1874 bell that they're referring to here. But if we go with the theory that this was actually the new era bell in the inventory, using dates from previous and later entries, we can be reasonably sure that the bell remained at the church as late as the mid-1950s. To date, we have not found a donor record for the 1874 bell, but we're actively searching the records and will update accordingly. We learned from an old pamphlet in a storage container that the new era bell was replaced in 1874 when the addition was put on that first structure. So the bell in these two images on the left is actually the bell that now sits atop the roof. Okay, so we were able to determine where it isn't, and at least where we're pretty sure it was up until the 1950s, which isn't a bad place to start. But here it is for sure, unfortunately behind the shutters, unseen as it has been since 1874. So in trying to think of places it may have gone, we decided to look into a mission church of St. James, better known as National Historic Landmark, the Church of the Presidents in Elberon. This location was built in 1877 as an extension of the St. James Congregation in Long Branch. Perhaps at some point they were in need of a bell. And just perhaps they borrowed one from their big brother in Long Branch. We'll never know until we can investigate it. Um, this location is under the stewardship of the Long Branch Historical Society and has undergone many renovations over the last couple of decades. As of this recording, we've been unsuccessful in getting through to anyone there, um, but we're very interested in what's in the bell tower, obviously, but more likely what may have gone into storage or a basement throughout these renovations. So we'll just have to keep you posted on the outcome of the mystery of the new era bell. In 1891, Asbury Park founder James Bradley erected a 12-foot-tall granite monument on the boardwalk to commemorate those who lost their lives in the tragedy, as well as to commemorate the brave efforts of the rescue crews that day. Bradley also recognized former New Jersey Governor William Newell, an instrumental figure in the eventual formation of the U.S. Life-Saving Service. Incredibly, only a few years later, a powerful storm managed to destroy much of the wooden boardwalk planks and tipped the obelisk off of its base and into the sand where it was buried. 
While recollections of the monument's location vary, the most credible sources place it on the former ocean promenade between 6th and 7th Avenue, roughly opposite the location of the New Era wreck. A photograph of the monument, printed in Julius Sasha's The Wreck of the Ship of the New Era upon the New Jersey coast, shows the monument standing behind a small iron rail at the boardwalk's east edge at some point prior to the 1896 storm. The chains from the New Era wreck were wrapped around the base of the monument. A second photo shows a woman posing beside the base of the monument, which was still standing at the time of the book's publication. Various attempts were made in the years that followed to recover the massive structure, but ultimately the work was never completed. The monument was left lying in the sands off 6th Avenue, where it very likely remains to this day. In 2012, an attempt was made to find this lost piece of history. Members of the Asbury Park Historical Society, with the aid of ground-penetrating radar specialists, searched the beach north of Convention Hall. Unfortunately, the monument remained hidden. So what exactly happened to this mystery monument? According to Google Maps, the present boardwalk at the foot of 6th Avenue spans a width of approximately 57 feet, compared to a 32-foot span at the time that the monument was erected. This puts the current location of the buried stone in the tightly confined space directly below the planks, roughly 25 feet in from the shore side. MTHA has been in contact with the city of Asbury Park about a potential recovery, but unfortunately this would require complete removal of large sections of the boardwalk. Perhaps one day the opportunity will present itself to solve the mystery of the missing monument once and for all. While the monument itself remains undiscovered, one recent find shed some light on its original location. We believe that the monument is visible in this newly discovered photo of the Ocean Promenade near 6th Avenue, taken in 1894. This image is only the second known photograph of this mysterious monument, which could significantly narrow future search parameters. Accusations were made that the ship was intentionally wrecked by Captain Thomas J. Henry in order to collect the hefty insurance money, as the ship was reportedly overinsured at $91,000. Whether this was ever his original intention, nobody can say for sure, though it seems highly unlikely that anyone could have predicted the weather conditions and horrific storm that occurred. Even if the plan was to wreck the ship, the captain and crew would have all had to have been in on the plan and trusted to keep such a horrible secret for their share of their remaining $20,000. This seems a very unlikely scenario. Even if unintentional, more lives likely could have been saved, and in this regard, Captain Henry is not blameless. His crew clearly lacked adequate training and the discipline to properly secure a line to the shore or convey safety protocols to the ship's passengers. Additionally, more than 40 passenger deaths can be attributed to an earlier outbreak of cholera, which is typically associated with contaminated food. This supports the accusations that food supplies were inadequate, especially since no crew members are reported to have contracted this disease. On the shore, Abner Allen's volunteer life-saving station at Deal Beach suffered severe equipment and manpower deficiencies. A routine inspection conducted prior to the wreck had concluded that among the deficits were a surfboat and a life car deemed out of order and spiral wires used for shot lines in bad condition. Volunteer lifesavers, while well-intentioned, were not properly trained. In addition, sailing vessels of the time were not required to undergo the same rigorous inspections as steam-powered vessels. It should be noted that none of this should reflect badly on Abner Allen, who by all accounts served his position honorably and as effectively as possible given the circumstances and continue to do so in the following years. Many of their survivors likely owe their lives to the kind-hearted hospitality of Mr. Allen and his wife in the days following the wreck. Naturally, any silver lining surrounding such a devastating wreck is eclipsed by the upwards of 250 people who tragically perished that day. But circumstances surrounding wrecks like that of the New Era did pave the way for much-needed change in maritime safety and life-saving stations. In the coming decades, federal legislation and funding began to address many of the inefficiencies. By 1871, substantial improvements had been made to the U.S. Life Saving Service, a predecessor to the U.S. Coast Guard. These included better equipped stations, full-time professionally trained crews, and more aggressive federal oversight.